Everyone, welcome. Good to see you this evening. This is the last in our four times together. Um, we, I'm not quite sure if Pastor Robbie's going to show up or not. He said he's going to come, but when you travel from the other side of the world and you arrive, evenings are not your friend. Okay, I've done it so many times. I know this factually. And you all of a sudden kind of decline. All your mental faculties go away one at a time. So we'll see if he has uh, enough oomph left in him after his travel back to North America. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started anyway, so I'll pray and then we'll just jump right in. Father, thank you so much again for the opportunity just to gather, to look into the things of the world of the patriarchs, especially Jacob and Joseph and, um, and their sons and, and their families. Um, it's a privilege to study these things. It's a privilege that you gave me to stumble into all of this, um, this gold mine of truth uh, about the ancient world. Thank you for the joy that you have in seeing it made known to the world even today. So go before us. Give me the words to speak. I pray that our hearts would be encouraged and challenged and edified as a result and that our awe of you would increase. That's ultimately the, the number one goal. Thank you for who you are and for what you have done and will do in us and through us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are, the last evening, and I'm going to do my best to give you two, two things instead of one. One of them is to identify Joseph for you in the ancient historical record. We've pretty much, uh, and I, we, we did that to an extent in our, what was it, our second day together, but today it kind of, we're going to drive it home. Um, and then after that, I'm going to take you just a little bit of ways into the study of, um, which was probably the most unexpected part of the research that I did and the, and the uh, discoveries that, that God dropped me into uh, was identifying Hebrew as the language behind the world's oldest alphabetic script. So we'll talk about that tonight with whatever time we have left after Joseph. So um, if you remember uh, when we parted last time before we had the flooding that prevented us from meeting, so this would have been a week ago, uh, we left with a question, who is Sobek Emchat? And why is that important? Because on the signet scarab of the ruler of Rechenu, the man who was ruling or leading as mayor, whatever word you want to, to provide for him, the city of Avaris, and this would have been where Jacob's family settled, um, on this signet scarab, is his name, the ruler of Rechenu, the, the mayor of that city. And his name is D. Sobek M. Chat. And the translation of that is, He whom Sobek M. Chat appointed. So his role in serving as mayor was given to him. The, the office, if you will, was, was provided by someone else. We talked about this last time and and you agreed with me that it was someone who was greater than he who was given this, uh, who gave him this position. And obviously, uh, being that Sobek Emchat is the part of his name that's a name in itself, it suggests that Sobek Emchat is greater than he was. So who is this figure, Sobek Emchat? And that's what we want to solve for today. Um, so, first of all, let's look at his mastaba at Dashur. So, in ancient Egypt, there's, you know, in, in, in their history, there was, I don't know how many, there was an enormous number of ways that you could bury someone. Whether that's um, a simple uh, pit grave, whether it's a shaft tomb, whether it's a pyramid, whether it's a mastaba, you name it, there's all kinds of ways to bury people. According to the person's position, and of course influence, and at the end of the day, money. It all comes down to that. Um, so near the top of, of this uh, hierarchy, if you will, of ways to be buried is the mastaba. And I, I can't say I can think of any uh, way that's 
that's any higher than this except for the pyramid itself, which would be royal. So if someone is buried with a, with a pyramid, it needs to be someone who's royal. That's pretty much how it worked. Um, maybe there's, I don't know, one or two exceptions that I'm not even aware of, um, and scholars could argue that, but I'm not aware of any situation where a, uh, anyone less than a royal was buried with a pyramid. Well, the mastaba was right under that, um, and I would equate it with, nowadays, something like a mausoleum. That's the closest parallel. So there was a man named Sobek Amchat from this very time period, the 12th dynasty, wouldn't you know, who was buried at a site called Dashur. And that's where his mastaba is located. So where's Dashur? Well, I don't know how much of an eagle eye you are, but there's a little tiny red dot on this slide where Dashur is. Um, and it's easier to see if you look at the Nile Delta, which basically goes up like a triangle, right? That's flat on the top, if you will, and its sides go like this. That's the, the, tr the delta, uh, the Nile Delta. So um, when the Nile flows downhill but to the north, and it's one of the few rivers that flows to the north, um, it spreads out once it hits the flatter country of the, of, the, um, of the Nile Delta, the marshlands. And it works its way in different tributaries, if you will, um, in, into where it dumps into the Mediterranean River, at least in antiquity, uh, into the Mediterranean Sea. So if you, if you look at the uh, Nile Delta like this, and, and of course the Nile is, is straight below it, just a little bit of the ways below that triangle, the base of that triangle, or the point of that triangle, um, is several cities. Uh, you can see on there maybe Cairo, and that's a modern city, of course, and then below that's Memphis. That's the ancient city. It was the first capital of Egypt. And then just a little ways below, barely a little ways below that, is Dashur. That's our site that we're going to look at here. It's in Middle Egypt of the ancient world between Memphis and El Lisht, which was a very important city during the 12th dynasty. Several pyramids of the kings of Dynasty 12 were built there, including those for Amenemhat II, Sesostris III, and we know him as the what pharaoh? Anybody remember? Sesostris III. Famine, Famine pharaoh, exactly. And his son, Amenemhat III. And who is Amenemhat III? What, what do we know about him? Anyone remember? Yes, he's his son. Mm -hmm. And when does he take over the throne? Well, his father's still alive. There's a co-regency. But who... Nope. Yes, Jacob dies in the same year that Amenemhat III ascends the throne as a co-regent. Exactly. Good memories. I'm impressed. I wouldn't have remembered so well. Um... And the pyramidal complex of Sesostris III helps to identify who Sobek Emchat is. So, oddly enough, it's funny how things work, isn't it? Oddly enough, this Sobek Emchat guy, who, remember, going back to this slide, he, his name is ingrained, um, inscribed really, on this um, amethyst scarab. Um, and it's, it's located, it's found all the way, um, well, north, but downhill in the Nile Delta. And yet, he's such a, an important figure that he shows up at Dashur, at the pyramidal complex of Sesostris III. And wouldn't, wouldn't you know that Sobek Amkat is connected to the famine pharaoh? Oddly enough. Uh, this is a recent, fairly recent uh, photograph of the, I guess you could call them the dilapidated remains of the pyramid of Sesostris III, as we can see it today. And, I, and of course, I mean, if you, if you were buried um, and it's thousands of years later, you should only hope to do so well that your tomb would it look this good, I think. So don't, don't look down on him for having such you know, a, a pyramid in such a terrible state. But that's, that's um, you know, time, the ravages of time and nature. It's, it's out in nature. It's not in a building, right? So you have the forces of nature, erosion and rain and wind and air and everything else that contributes. Um, well, if you were to go back in antiquity, of course, when it really looked good, that pyramid, 
Um, this is what it would look like from above. So the large rectangle that's a little bit above center uh, in this slide is the, it's the courtyard, essentially, if you will, of the entire pyramidal structure or set of pyramids. So the X that looks like a square there, um, you know, you're just seeing this in 2D. Picture that the point where the X comes together is rising high. So that's the point of the pyramid that rises above. And that's where Sesostris III was buried. So he had a large pyramid here at the site of Dashur. And actually, um, in case somebody would dispute this with you later who knows something about e Egyptology, Sesostris III had two pyramidal cities. He had a first one that's here at Dashur, and he had another one um, at Abida, it's called Abydos South, which is actually far to the south. Um, if you go upstream on the Nile River which, to the south, you'll eventually get there. And we can't be 100% conclusive at which uh, site he was buried, but virtually every e Egyptologist agrees that it's at Abida South where he, where he was buried. So this was his first pyramidal city. And remember, he, he reigned for a long period of time. What is it, 39 years, I think, in total before he died? So it's no surprise that he has two pyramidal cities. And of course, he was the richest pharaoh easily of the 12th dynasty and of the Middle Kingdom, easily. So he could afford to have two pyramidal cities built. Um, well, this one um, contains not only his pyramid, pyramid but the, there are pyramids to the side. You can see um, vertically, three on one side and four on another. These are royal pyramids that probably are uh, members of his immediate family. Because of their royal blood, they were given pyramids, but they're much smaller in size and stature than the pyramid of the king um, himself. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, there's, there's lots going on in this, in this image. Um, to, looking at the, at, at the drawing, though, to the right of the, um, of the courtyard that encloses all of those pyramids, it's a Middle Kingdom cemetery. And the various sized squares on there and rectangles represent different sized uh, burial tombs or, uh, or, or burials, however they were. So you can see that there, is, there isn't just uh, there isn't just a burial for elite here. There's, there are burials for people of various um, grades, if you will, uh, in society. Um, up and down the social ladder. So among those, though, the three largest ones outside of the royal um, pyramidal courtyard are all mastabas, and I have th three red arrows pointing to them. There's one that's the closest to the king's pyramid. That's the largest of the three. And then there's one in the center and one on the end. Um, the one on the end, we, we can't identify whose pyramid that was, uh, who's, I'm sorry, Mastaba that was, uh, the one in the center we can identify as a man named Nebit, and we'll, we'll come um, back to him in a moment. Then, the one that's the closest uh, to the king's pyramid and the largest is or was inhabited by a, name, a man named Sobek M. Chat, surprise of surprises. Now, um, if and I forget how much we may have talked about this when we were together in one of the last two sessions, but if I didn't mention it then, I can mention it to you now that, um, okay, when, when Joseph is elevated over Egypt, it would have been under the um, abundance pharaoh, and we know him as what king? Sesostris, what number? The second, exactly. And Sesostris II happens to die in the same year as the end of the, fam uh, end of the abundance. And that's when the seven years of famine um, begin. So we have seven years of, of prosperity and seven years of um, dearth. Uh, there's no rainfall. There's no, um, you know, the, the, Ni the level of the Nile River goes down. We already saw that happening at Avaris. So... Um, so all of this is taking place um, 
uh, at the during the reign of Sesostris II, and then and then the famine begins and goes into the first seven years of the of the reign of Sesostris III. Um, so that being the case, if Joseph is second in command, uh, according to the biblical text, five years into the famine, it, and I'm, tr I'm correct on that, right? Five years into the famine, um, uh, Joseph's family comes down to Egypt. True? So if that's true, we're now five years into, from the beginning, five years, the first five years of Sesostris III's reign. So that means... Since Joseph was second in command at the time he was appointed, and that continued throughout the lifetime of Sesostris II, it means if he's second in command still, five years into Sesostris III's reign, it means he was second in command for one entire reign and at least five years into the next reign. True? So at the beginning, think of the transition point. At the beginning, who is second in command in all of Egypt when Sesostris III takes the throne? Joseph, true? Well, what do you know? Who's Mas and, and these three Mastabas, by the way, are what's called vizierial Mastabas. They were inhabited by viziers, and I'll prove that to you momentarily. Uh, the vizier, it's a title that we use for the person who was directly under the king. And anything that the king needed or um, um, anything that needed to go through a chain of a command, it would go through the vizier first. So among these three viziers, the first one, I'm sorry, um, okay, question. Where, based on the, the location of these three mastabas, which one do you think logically is the one inhabited by the first of these three viziers. The one closest to the king, exactly. That's how it works. And then subsequent vizierial mastabas are built further away. And every Egyptologist who studies the 12th dynasty is in agreement on that. I don't know of any who disagree. So, you know, I'm not stepping out on any, any limbs to say that. So, Basically, what that tells us is we have an amazing parallel here between Joseph's, according to the Bible, the, the biblical description of who should be second in command um, from the time of the famine, uh, I'm sorry, from the time of the beginning of the abundance, seven, those seven years, and five years in, into the seven years of the famine. There should be one person, Joseph, for all 12 years who's second in command. And look how that matches with ancient Egyptian history. To a T. Because so, if, if Sobek Amchat is Joseph. Because if he is, it, he fits perfectly as the vizier who had that prime location um, among the vizierial mastabas at Dashur. And by the way, uh, so that I don't forget to mention it, the number one task on the job description list for a vizier, oddly enough, is to build the pyramidal city of his king. That's first and foremost. And then everything else just slips in wherever in that job description. That's number one. So it's no surprise that the vizier ends up building his own tomb in that proximity. True? Because he's hired for that task as the number one job. And so while he's there, he may, he's got a bunch of engineers around, he's got a bunch of workers around, and you know he's got the king's ring, and he, life's good. Build my own tomb, right? So that's what he does. He builds his own, has his own tomb built. So there it is. All right, um, this is just a, in case you didn't see it well enough, this is a, a blow up, if you will, of uh, the pyramid of the king, the largest one represented by that X there, and then those seven... Um, probably familial royal uh, pyramids that are on either side of it. Again, all of this is within a courtyard that's designed to protect these pyramids from being robbed at the end of the day. That's why, why it's there. Um, the courtyard that's, uh, and you know, the walls that are built around this. Okay, now here's a zooming in on the three vizierial mastabas. So the one on the far, our far right 
which would have been the third in the string of viziers under Sesostris III. Um, we don't have any um, remnant, any artifact that's survived to tell us who he was, what, is, what was his name, you know, etc., anything about him. So we don't really know um, who that man was. The one in the center we know as Nebit, um, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but what is to us at the top of the screen under Nebit's, um, within Nebit's um, Mastaba is a rectangle on the outer edge there, and it, there's an arrow pointing down into it, and above it says wife's tomb. So that's where his wife would have been buried, and he would, he would have, Nebit would have been the, um, the vizier, but that's where his wife would have been buried in that same tomb. Then looking at Sobek and Chatz, um, same thing, we have a wife's tomb in the, basically in the same position, and so that model would have been followed undoubtedly in the building of the second pyramidal mastaba. Then we also have um, um, a place where Sobek and Chatz was, was buried. Now, what's fascinating about Sobek and Chatz and his vizierial tomb, and this was excavated by the French in somewhere around the turn of the century, that's the 19th to the 20th century. So before 1920, somewhere in that range, I'm not, I don't remember exactly when it was, but they really started publishing all of this in the early 20s. Um, the French team, and of course they wrote everything in, in French, and so you know, I had to use uh, the, the, the French skills that I learned in my PhD program, which um, you know, I was challenged with French. I was a lot better with German than French, but um, I was able to, to decipher um, what they had to say about this vizierial mastaba, and they said that in antiquity, somebody robbed out the sarcophagus, i.e., the body of the person who was buried here, that, that I'm calling so far Sobek Amchat. Isn't that amazing? What happens to Joseph after his death? Uh huh. Eventually, right? It's not right away, right? What, at what time does Joseph, Joseph's body, if you will, go back to Canaan to be buried? At the time of the Exodus, 1446 B.C. We're in the 800, 1800s B.C. right now. So, um, and according to, to the chronology that, I, um, that, I, um, that I've settled upon with the help of um, several fantastic biblical chronologists, 1805 would be the year that Joseph died. So he would have been buried here in approximately 1805 B.C. Um, so, yes, Joseph, uh, at the time of the Exodus, his, his body was confiscated, if you will, and buried uh, in Canaan. That being the case, where was he buried? Well, if he is Sobek Amchat, he fits perfectly with the historical situation here because this man, his body never survived out of antiquity. It was robbed out and taken away. So, um, it fits if this is Joseph. Well, let me identify for you quickly, uh, prove to you that Nebit is who I say he is and especially that he's a vizier. And I'm, again, not the first one to suggest this. Um, but when they excavated the, you know, when, when the French excavated the, um, the, the remains of the Mastaba, and it, it, of course it wouldn't have been complete, it would have been in a, in a pretty probably broken down state, but what remained, um, they were able to kind of collect, and there were a bunch of stone slabs, and so these are some casing slabs from his Mastaba. And if you look at one of the um, the pieces of stone, you can see this absolutely gorgeous inscription. I don't know if you remember from our second time together, I showed you that Esbet Rushdie Stella, and I said that's from the hand, I'm, I'm convinced that's from the hand of Joseph himself. Do you remember how kind of, it was a poor man's hieroglyphics? Remember that? This is the opposite. This is the best of the royal scribes who are inscribing this on the royal mastaba. So it's absolutely gorgeous Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, and there's writing at the top, and then as you go down, it's a title string, what we call a title string. It means various titles of that man, and we'll see that with Sobek Amchat later as well. So the first one is 
iri pot, which is member of the elite. Um, and then there's um, chati a, the second one. It, it's represented there by the lion with the four paws. And that means foremost of hand. Those are two very important titles for high, people high up in, in rank in relation to the king. Then the third one down is, um, the hieroglyphics there, is mer niut, which means the pyramidal tomb. And you can see below there's that pyramid hieroglyph, right? It means the pyramidal tomb city of the king. That's what mer niut means. And then below that, and it's kind of cut off because below the stone was broken off, but there is a very distinct hieroglyph that's very unique. And that hieroglyph means ch uh, chati. Chati is the word literally for the shrouded one. Do you remember the descriptions of Moses when he was, you know, um, going kind of back and forth? He's talking to God one minute, he's talking to the people the next, he's talking to God. And, and there was something special about Moses, right? He had this, this glow. W what did he wear to, to hide the glory that was kind of showing up on his face? Yeah, a shroud, a veil. That's exactly what he wore so that, you know, that wouldn't negatively impact anyone else, I suppose. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, the word here is the shrouded one. This is the one who also undoubtedly in Egypt, not, not in, in Israelite history, but in Egyptian history, he would have been veiled or shrouded because of his position, how high he was, second in command. The average person, in the way they thought, shouldn't be looking upon the vizier. That's how high he was, how revered he was. So that hieroglyph clues us right in to this, this description, shrouded one. The shrouded one is a title that's only used, or a term, I should say, that's only used of one person, and that's the vizier, second in command. So without a shadow of a doubt, this mastaba is vizierial. And since it's a virtual carbon copy of the ones to either side, except that Sobekam Katz is bigger, um, they all three must be vizierial mastabas. They all have the same constructional methods that were applied. So all three of those are clearly vizierial mastabas. All right, Sobek Emchat's name, because now we know that, you know, and I didn't show you the slide. I, didn't, I don't have a slide with Nebit's name on it, but there, Nebit's name does appear in, on one of those stones. So his, his tomb is identified, clear, his mastaba is identified. Well, can we identify the one that, that we're calling, I'm calling for you, Sobek Emchatz mastaba? Yes, the remnants of you know, what was left with that first largest vizierial mastaba include a bunch of fragments of this quartzite offering table. And of course, this is just a black and white drawing of it. You don't get to see any of the beauty. Um, but it's, it's a quartzite offering table originally with titled inscriptions, including the name Sobek Emchat, or part of the name of Sobek Emchat, who's the first vizier under Sesostris III. And it's represented in the lower left, and it's, um, I have um, vertical red lines. I don't know if you can see those or not, but I have vertical red lines around. And so um, there's an alligator, and then there is an owl. So that's Sobak, Sobek and M. That's the Sobek M part of the name Sobek M Khat. And it's, you know, on, at various places on this, um, excuse me, on this offering table, there are, just as we saw before, there are these titles. Remember, there's this title string, member of the elite, uh, member of the elite foremost of hand. Same titles, right? And those are the titles we saw of the vizier, Nebit. So clearly, this is another vizier that we're talking about here. Well, how do we know that this is truly Sobek M. Khatz, um, vizier, um, I'm sorry, his mastaba? Well, because if we look at, oh, and this is, by the way, just a reconstruction by a friend of mine, graduated from the University of Toronto with me before I did. He works at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he has reconstructed what this would have looked like, and hopefully by now he's published that. I'm not sure if he has. 
but you can see in that same lower left position, he's superimposed a lion's head with the, um, the paws extended. And that is chat, right? That's, that's chat. That's where it would have been, what would have been positioned there, and that's where it would have been. How do we suggest that, that this was there with confidence? Well, there was another um, broken off piece of stone that had hieroglyphic um, remnants on it, and it's the one with the red on it in the upper right in your screen. And that has the, the tail feathers of an owl. And an owl is what we saw on the quartzite, um, right here on the quartzite offering table. So it clearly has an owl um, hieroglyph there. Well, that's exactly what we have here as far as the, the tail feathers. That is an owl's tail feathers. Then, below it, we have that lion's head with the paws, and that's clearly chat. And below that, it looks like uh, uh, half, of the, half of the moon, you know, when the moon's rising, or half of the sun at sunset, whatever, however you want to look at that. Um, and that actually is it's not an image of a celestial body. That's a bread loaf, believe it or not. And the bread loaf makes the t sound, like a T. So um, we have the tail feathers of an owl, and the owl hieroglyph makes the m sound. And then below it, we have the chat, and then we have a, a bread loaf making the t sound. That's basically what we would call superfluous. It doesn't have to be there, but they just add it there. So clearly, this is M chat. So if you take the quartzite offering table together with this, um, the hieroglyphs on this stone that was found in the same place, you piece it together and you come up with Sobek M chat. That was published by a famous Egyptologist uh, who died recently, uh, William Simpson. He published it in the, I don't remember, 60s or something like that, 60s or 70s, somewhere in that vicinity. And nobody has disputed it since. So clearly, this is Sobek uh tomb, his mastaba. Well, having proven that to you, I hope, now we want to look at the funerary inscription of Sobek M. Uh, it's going to be that. So before I show you the slide, let me tell you that the historical part of all of this um, is really um, amazing. Um, so when that French excavational team uh, was was at Dashur, and they were excavating various parts of the site, not just uh, Sesosus III's pyramidal city, but there were other pyramidal cities from kings that were there. So I don't remember, it was like a, a mile or two away, somewhere in that vicinity, there was another king's pyramidal city. And there, um, one of the excavators found a way down in, I guess through a shaft or something, found a way down in uh, in one of the buildings that was um, that was built there, and in so it's basically below ground, and and when he got into this place, it was somehow never never found, never robbed out in in, in antiquity, and um, and there he found a statue that was positioned with its arms out, and on top of the arms of that whatever it was, a person or a, um, a deity, I forget what, it, what exactly it was, but the arms were out, and it was, a, it was actually an earlier king than Sesostris III. And on his arms was this square funerary inscription that totally did not belong there. It's what we call out of context. It didn't, you know, because it's Sobek Amchat's funerary inscription. It's from when he died. And he died from a king that's later in relation to the king who was buried in this area where the inscription was found. Does that make sense? So somebody purposefully deposited the funerary inscription of Sobek Amchat literally in a crazy place on top of the arms of a statue so that it could be preserved for future generations. And then it was all you know, buried and never, never gone into again. Fascinating, right? That's where it was. And again, it was there purposefully. No doubt about it. Somebody wanted that funerary inscription to survive. And obviously thought it couldn't survive where it was at the present time, at the, um, at the actual mastaba of Sobek and Khat. They were afraid that 
that it would be lost forever or destroyed or something. So here's the inscription. And by the way, uh, this image was published by the French in the 20s, but nobody has ever published a full translation of it. Guess who's going to be the first? I am. Um, Middle Egyptian is the, or is, was, whatever, the first minor of my PhD. So um, I have my translation completed and it's ready to go and when my, when my second book is done, and the second book is providing evidence for Israelites in Egypt from the time of Jacob's arrival until the Exodus. So this will be in one of the, the, pub, the translation will be in one of the appendices in the back of the book. And I'll be referring to it in the text of the book. Well, there's some, there are some important things that are on here. Once again, we have a title string. I won't go into the details on the type of inscription this was for time's sake so we can move to other things, but um, down in the green box, those hieroglyphs mean for the spirit of. So now we're getting to the real point. Who is the person who's buried here? Who is the person we're commemorating by inscribing this funerary inscription? So it's saying, for the spirit of, the immaterial part of, and so here comes the person. But if you remember from what I told you before, when a person's name is listed, a person of influence, a person of position, it's always the position first, the title or titles first, and then the name. And that's exactly what we have here. It's perfect Middle Egyptian. So here's that title string. Um, Member of the elite, we saw that before. Foremost of hand in pink, we saw that before. Then, all of a sudden, we come to a fantastical, if you will, set of hieroglyphs. Um, this set of hieroglyphs, if you translate it, it translates to something that never before or never after is seen or, or written of an official in ancient Egypt. It's a one of a kind. It's so extraordinary that the, that the world's foremost authority, um, Grajewski is his name, he's European, foremost authority on the Middle Kingdom officials literally refused to translate this literally because the, in his estimation it had to be a scribal error because nobody has had that position before and nobody again, so it must be wrong. But, this of course is the danger of changing the text of the ancient writings. You can't just do that on a whim. You think they didn't know what they were doing? You think we know better than they? So what does it mean? Controller of the entire land. If you crack open your Bible to Genesis 41, verse, chapter 41, verse 41, you will see that Almost, word for word, it describes there that, that one of the ranks or positions Joseph was given is that he was put over the entire land of Egypt. Here it is. On a funerary inscription, and oddly enough, on a funerary inscription from Sobek Amchat, who, oddly enough, was the one who appointed D. Sobek Amchat, an Asiatic, as the mayor of Avaris, where Jacob settled, who, oddly enough, was the brother of the brother of the ruler of Retchenu, Chebeded, whose name means he who was disfavored, who just happened to be the seemingly the father of a little boy who would grow in all of the um, stele that were, were um, inscribed year after year when they would go down for these um, uh, mining expeditions to extract turquoise from Sinai, from Serbi el Khadim, his son was named Shechem, which is an exact transliteration, uh, not of an Egyptian name, but of a Semitic name. And by the way, Manasseh's son, one of the sons of Manasseh is named Shechem. Is all of this just coincidence? It's, it's the willful suspension of disbelief to be able to suggest that. So, that's one title that's given. And then the next title in the red um, 
uh, if you can see the red um, rectangle there, those hieroglyphs together mean he who has authority over every preeminent office. And if you look up Genesis 41, 25, and then 38 and 39, you will see that everybody else there is placed under Joseph's authority. So this fits perfectly with Joseph and one of the titles that he would have had in ancient Egypt. And then, in the middle of the last line, the bottom line on this funerary inscription, is the name, finally we get to the point, who is this man? And there, now... Uh, what you see on the r in the blue box on the upper right, in the upper right, it looks like something like a jackal if you look at it. But oddly enough, crazy as it sounds, every Egyptologist would agree that actually is a um, a crocodile. And that, of course, is where we get Sobek. And then the owl, owl is M. And then the lion with the paws and the bread loaf forms chat. So we have Sobek M. Chat, clearly on this funerary inscription. This is the man who was buried in this mastaba. So I say unto you tonight that you are looking at the funerary inscription of Joseph as it was placed on his mastaba at the time of his death, if not before. And it would have been sitting there for centuries, until the Israelites, at the time of the Exodus, sent a little party, a little team, probably of, you know, 20 or 30 year old guys who could run fast, right? He sent them upstream to Dashur. They collected the body of Joseph. They saw the funerary inscription and they said, we're not taking this with us, but we're going to leave it in a place where it can be preserved. So they found a place at Dashur, a mile or two away, and they went down in this tomb uh, or this structure and they found a statue and set it on its arms, closed it up, and took off with Joseph's sarcophagus with his bones inside, met, met up with the Israelites, and 40 years later it was buried in Canaan. Isn't that amazing? And God has preserved all of us, uh, all of this for us to see today. For some reason or reasons, he wants this to be made known. For thousands of years, from 1446 until now, this hasn't been exposed to anyone and its significance. Now it is. Now God wants this to be known for a reason or reasons. And I don't even know, I can barely scratch the surface of all of God's intentions. I'd love to know them all, but I can't. I do know this. I do know this. When the Exodus occurred and the plagues on Egypt took place, they were as part of the reason and the rationale, and God himself said this, so that all of the nations around the Israelites would know who he is. That's why. And having seen that in Scripture, I conclude that today, in our lifetime, God now wants this all to be made known so that His name can be glorified to attest to all that He did according to the Scripture in the days of Joseph and his sons. All right, let's march on. So the death of Jacob and um, those of his generation, which, if you remember, I talked about how at Avaris we had these first two occupational phases. First there was D2, and then there was D1. That J Jacob's occupational level was D2. That's the first one. Actually, it would have been underneath. D2 is underneath. D1 is above. And so it would have been the first occupational phase of the Asiatics that I'm suggesting to you. These are Israelites, and that will be, again, proven more... Um, succinctly in my second book. Um, and we want to take a look, look at a couple things related to this. So that we're, we're back to our map. This is the site of Avaris in the upper right of the Nile Delta. That's where Avaris is located and, and where the Israelites were. Um, and if you remember, um, the, 
the position of several things. The Israelites were to the left of center. So if you go all the way to the left from center and just below that, that's the area where um, Jacob and his family um, occupied in the beginning of their stay at Avaris. And the place is in dark black. That's where the excavation has been going on for four plus decades. Um, the excavators suggest that, that these tombs, and, and if you remember, I suggested to you that, that there, were, there was a tomb of, um, of De Sobek Amchat, clearly it was, and I suggested to you that's Ephraim, that's Joseph's son who received the birthright. And among, you know, around his tomb were other tombs, and so uh, this, for example, is grave one in that same area, and that's what uh, the excavators think it would have looked like. So it would have had a structure, of course, below the surface of the ground, and it would have had a superstructure above the surface of the ground, and that's what you see here. Now, um, I don't remember how much I talked about this, but, un but um, within that area, that, that part of Avaris from the 12th dynasty, that first Asiatic occupational level, we looked at, especially at that massive complex that I called a, you know, the, the excavators, or excavators originally called it a palace, and I suggested to you that it's not a palace because there's no throne, and I said it's something like a villa or um, a, um, a mansion that's just room after room after room. Well, beneath that, at one point, is a, what we call a tripartite building that actually, I would call it a precursor to the four-room house. Israelites, when they lived in, in Canaan, and which became Israel, they had a certain architectural design known, at, known to us, to archaeologists, as a four-roomed house. So basically, it was usually one, two, three, and then four at the top. And that's exactly what we have here. We have, we have a court, a larger courtyard. So this is the large building that's kind of teetering here in your screen, in your view. And that larger part of it is the courtyard. That's the walls of the courtyard, just like we had with the pyramidal tomb complex or pyramidal city at Dashur for Sesostris III. Here we have a courtyard. So probably, whatever, children were playing out in there or animals, you know, their prized animals were grazing in there. We don't really know. But, um, but then within that courtyard is a building. And what do you know? It's a tripartite building with a, you know, on the, on the top, from our view, uh, another rectangle-shaped room. So that is exactly what we see the Israelites living in hundreds of years later in Canaan. And I would call this the precursor to the four-roomed house of the Israelites. And I suggest to you, this was actually Jacob's home. Is there a name on it? No, I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. But there's no doubt in my mind it's Jacob's home. Why am I so confident? And um, Bryant Wood, my archaeology mentor, he's convinced that this is, you know, he's convinced of the same thing. Um, this building, by the way, was called by the German-speaking Austrian excavators the Mittelzahlhaus. Um, and, um, and where, was it, where was it positioned in relation to this later, immediately afterward, this mansion of room after room? Where was it in relation to all of these rooms? Well, the, the main rooms in this mansion are to the top right of the screen. They're, they're, they're twin rooms. They're, they're basically, um, uh, what's the term? Symmetrical. So... If you were to superimpose the, the earlier beneath it, beneath the mansion, you were to superimpose, where was that tripartite building that actually looks like a four-roomed house? Where was it? It was right below the two master bedrooms. And again, the average ancient house didn't have two master bedrooms, but one. This makes sense if it were Ephraim and Manasseh, the two brothers who were stolen away by Jacob and lived here um, for the rest of their lives. So this continuity between the first occupational phase represented by that red building and the second occupational phase where the heart of that mansion, right? If it's like a body, the heart of it, where's the heart beating? 
It's right there, the two master bedrooms. Those were built first right on top of the structure below it. The structure below is Asiatic in architectural style. Ja uh, Jacob was, a was an Asiatic. He would have come into Egypt and built according to his own design, what he's used to, what he sees in Canaan. But when Ephraim and Manasseh arrive on site and they say, we're going to build something way better than this, they would have leveled that house, right? And they would have filled in, you know, with dirt and rubble and whatever, the fill that they would use, and they would just start building. And they would use Egyptian design, Egyptian style, Egyptian tools. And that's all what we find with that second occupational phase. It fits the biblical narrative perfectly. All right, uh, one of the grave finds from that first occupational phase is a duckbill axe. And a duckbill axe it certainly looks like a duckbill if you look at it from above like this. It's not a weapon, but a tool. And uh, it's, a, it's a, if you will, a Canaanite tool. So this, this reinforces the, the notion that the people who lived here were clearly Asiatic people. They weren't Egyptian people. They had, a, they had um, sorry, they had uh, Asiatic architectural style, that first occupational phase, Asiatic graves, they had Asiatic tools. It, everything shows that they were Asiatics. Um, and where does this fit in the typology of axes of the ancient world? Well, the duckbill axe is in the lower left here, and it was essentially between 1960 and 1800 B.C. when the duckbill axe was in use. And sure enough, the burial there at Avaris um, would have been somewhere around the end of the 19th century B.C., so just before or, or around 1800 B.C. And so the person would have had, you know, di sobek amchat, that I'm saying is Ephraim. He would have had uh, um, a duckbill axe. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, no. Before that, one, one generation earlier. Jacob's generation, one of his sons or one of his servants or whatever, would have had um, this, you know, this very axe that I showed you in the last slide, and that fits perfectly in the time frame of when these axes were used in Canaan. Um, it's displayed on a, um, a wall tomb, the tomb of uh, an Egyptian named Knumhotep II at Beni Hassan, way upstream in, um, in southern Egypt. And this was from year six of Sesostris II, who is the what pharaoh? Abundance pharaoh, yeah. That duckbill axe is from his reign. And that's the exact time period that the Israelites show up in Egypt, isn't it? So it's no surprise that they would have that very tool that's found in the tomb of um, Knumhotep who lived during the reign of Sesostris II. Um, I actually have a, an authentic duckbill axe blade and my uncle, who's a woodworking guru, made me a nice handle for it. And, and so this is, this is mine. I, I probably could have brought, brought it, but you know, if you ever invite me back and I talk about this again, you can remind me and I will bring it. Um, kids love this, of course, but I have to warn them about you know, not using it on their brothers or their sisters. That doesn't go over well with mom and dad. And then I get in trouble. Um, but what's, what's interesting is where you see this guy holding it in, in, the, uh, in the tomb painting, you see where he's holding it there on one end of the shaft, right by the blade, and when I saw this, I thought, why? That's, that seems so imbalanced. Why is he holding it there? Then when, once my uncle finished making this for me, I, I decided, where's the center of gravity? So I found, put it on my finger, and I found the center of gravity, and guess where it is? Exactly where that guy's hand was. So that's the duckbill axe. Um, there's more evidence for Jacob's death. Um, there was a, an, a, a sculpture of a, an Asiatic man that was found in many different pieces spread around in more than one phase of the Asiatic's occupation there at Avaris. Um, and this hairdo, it's, talk about a wild hairdo, I don't know, maybe like for me it takes me back to the 60s or something, but um, this is called the mushroom coifer hairdo and this is very Asiatic. And it's well, well lined um, well um, sculpted, very finely sculpted, 
This is a profile view of it. And you can see that the face was broken off in antiquity. So somebody didn't think highly of this Asiatic person. Now, my guess is it wasn't a fellow Asiatic. Uh, my guess is it, it was either in Egypt or an enemy of the Israelites. But anyway, um, this represents somebody from Joseph's lifetime. And I don't know how you, well you can see this or not, but faintly you can see colors. There are the colors, um, and so this is a drawing of it. The colors of white, red, and black paint were found on the shoulder blade of the um, statue. So originally it was painted, and it would have been gorgeous, this statue. And it's the same colors that we saw on the kilts of the people who were doing the excavation, uh, the, the um, uh, not the excavation, the... Um, the turquoise mining down in Sinai, the exact same colors. Um, so this is what it would have looked like. Black and red stripes intermittent with white. Um, and this, of, this slide, of course, shows that continuity with everything that went on down at the mines. Clearly, mines that were worked by Egyptians and whoever they hired so the entire operation came from Egypt, and I suggest to you at this time it came from Avaris. So um, this is what a, an artist, um, how an artist rendered what the statue would have looked like if you were to draw in you know, all the missing pieces or the missing elements, and it would show you that it's a man seated here, um, an Asiatic man on a... Um, a chair of some kind. And uh, there's a part in the front, um, so basically below the feet at the base, um, there was an inscription there. Sadly, most of the inscription is gone. If the inscription would have been preserved, folks, I think it would blow your minds. But there's one word that was preserved, oddly enough, and it's the word senetur. The senetur means incense. I didn't read it to you or show it to you on the Sobek Amchat funerary inscription, but it was on that inscription. And that inscription is what we call a, 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 um, a um, chetep dinesu, an, um, an offering presented by the king. That's what, it's, that's what it means, a chetep dinesu. It's an offering presented by the king. So that's the word that we see connected to funerals when people are buried. Ergo, this person is someone who was buried. Uh, I'm sorry, someone who died. Someone who died. Now, uh, there's, a, there's an Egyptologist named David Roll who suggested that um, this is Joseph's um, statue. Well, wrong, close, but wrong. That's just not the case. Um, a famous Egyptologist named Dorothea Arnold, who was German and just recently retired, she did a study of the funerary, um, no, she did a study of the statuary from this time period, from the 12th dynasty and specifically the, um, the, the 19th century BC, and she found that this statue has all of the char important characteristics of the statuary from the statues that were made inscribed, created, at a site called Hawara, and that's in the Fayum. And Hawara is where Amenemkat III built this, um, it's like a factory for producing statues. That's what it was. So this one matches all of those. So she is 100% convinced this was made from that factory where they made statues in the reign of Sosra, uh, Amenemkat III. That being the case, Amenemkat III came onto the throne the year who died? Jacob. Oh, the year Jacob died. Joseph lived all the way to 1805, to about the end of the century, right before the final reign. Um, and by that time, Egypt was in disarray. So Joseph lived on through the period of the reign of of Amenemkat III and several reigns later. So this, there's no way that this would be his funerary statue. It would be there to commemorate a dead person 
because senetur, incense, is referring to the, 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 um, the funerary inscription of that person. That being the case, Jacob is the perfect candidate because he lived here, because he was the patriarch. And what happened to his body? Was he buried in Egypt? Yes? No. Where was he buried? Canaan. Immediately his body was taken to Canaan and buried. So there was no tomb to remember, for the Israelites to remember their forefather. Right? But if they were in with the Egyptians, with the king especially, they could easily put in an order, put in a request for a statue to be built in honor of their patriarch. So this undoubtedly was Jacob. All right. Um, now, with the time that we have left, and no, I'm not going to be taking you to 10 or 11 tonight, even though I'd like to, I want to finish off by talking about um, the deciphering of this alphabetic script. So, the world's oldest alphabetic script, it goes back to the 19th century B.C., which, oddly enough, that's the same time when Joseph lived, isn't it? and Ephraim, and Manasseh, and Jacob. True? Everybody agrees about this, the oldest alphabetic script. Everybody agrees that it's a Semitic language behind it. Almost everybody, and it should be everybody, but it's almost everybody agrees that it's based on hieroglyphs, which means the people who made the first alphabetic script, which is a Semitic script, had to be fluent up and down, back and forward in Egyptian. And all of the earliest inscriptions were found in Egypt and Sinai. It tells you they lived there. They were Asiatics who lived there. The Bible says that's where the Israelites lived at that time. Okay? So, for about 150 years, scholars have tried to identify the language behind this script. They, over the period of the decades, they were able to identify certain letters and know the Phonetic value, is it a B sound, is it a R sound, is it a K sound? What's the consonant that's behind it? And <clears throat> within that, several words were deciphered. But on the whole, it has not been deciphered in full from then until um, much more recently. Um, so in the 1920s, there was a German... Egyptologist, no, a German scholar, who published that he had deciphered this oldest alphabetic script, and he said it's Hebrew. Well, as you can guess, this did not go over well at all with the academy. He was ostracized, he was hated, he was um, mocked, he was laughed at, he was humiliated, he was not included in conferences and in meetings and so forth, uh, all because he connected it to Hebrew. Well, the truth is, at that time, we didn't know enough of the letters accurately, the, the phonetic value for each letter of that alphabet, to be able to, um, to properly identify words and where words start and where they end because it's all continuous script. And so he made of a, bu a bunch of assertions that were proven later to be wrong. So his thesis, which is this is Hebrew, was thrown out the window with him and his theory and, you know, anything that he had right. It was all just thrown out. You know, you throw out the baby with the bathwater. Then, um, when I was doing all of this research, I stumbled upon Sinai 115, which we're going to be coming to soon. Um, so this is a, an image of, of my book, which is here, and I have six copies. If anyone's interested, I sell them at cost for me to buy it at my discount and have it shipped from Jerusalem here. So it's $50 even. The cost would be cheaper if I were the one who appointed the cost. I wasn't. It was the publisher. Um, so I have six copies left. And, and my book translates 15 inscriptions. So, in, in stumbling into all this evidence of Israelites in Egypt, on one of these stele, I saw what I'm going to be showing you later was something that's different than hieroglyphics. I, I saw two, what we can call pictographs, that were not 
hieroglyphs, and I knew something fishy is going on here. So um, anyway, um, the, the dis so, so basically um, what I fell into was that this was clearly, there's a connection between Manasseh, Joseph's oldest son, and the appearance of the first alphabetic letter, which was on an inscription that's mostly Middle Egyptian, um, but it shows there's a connection between him and the advent of this writing system. The most brilliant writing system ever um, conceived because it's so simple and anyone can use it. You don't have to be a scribe. You don't have to be uh, trained in a school. You can just learn it by knowing words in your own language and that's it. So when, when I discovered this connection, I knew, oh my goodness, this German scholar who I later found out about in the 1920s, he was exactly right. That is Hebrew. So my task was to take all of the, the disputed letters that we don't really, scholars don't know really what's the, for certain, what's the consonantal value of it, how it's pronounced. I had to resolve, to solve what all of those were. That was my task. And it took me months and months and months when I should have been writing my dissertation. Instead, I was on a research trail. So one at a time, I was able to solve that question because it's just it's scientific. It's plug and play. You try several different consonants in, you know, in that position. One scholar says it's this sound, a r. One says it's the g. One says it's the sh. So you try all those options, right? And, there's, and, and it's the case that whichever one is right, it's going to be right 100% of the time. And, and whichever ones are wrong, they'll be wrong enough that it's never going to be 100% of the time right. So process of elimination, I eliminated all of the, the wrong options. And sure enough, slowly but surely, I worked toward identifying every letter correctly. Then I got samples of every individual letter and worked with them one at a time. And I needed to figure out what was the original picture behind that letter because that's the beauty of the system. Um, for a house, which we'll, we'll see in a minute, you draw the picture of a square, which is how uh, in Canaanite you would draw a house. And it's similar in, in Egyptian. You would draw an Egyptian house like this. This, like a rectangle. And then there's this open area at the base for the, the doorway. But in Canaanite, it was a square. And that's what um, Manasseh ends up writing on this stella. So I, I, I deciphered all of these letters, and then I, I worked with each letter to know what was the original meaning behind that pictograph and figured out all of those, and that took a long time. And then I went back to the inscriptions that were complete enough or whole enough that I knew could be translated if you know every one of those letters. And so slowly, one inscription at a time, I went through 15 inscriptions and translated them. And that's all in my book. And their meaning is in the book. Um, and it was very careful, very, they were very tedious, meticulous work. And I had several people checking certain things for me, including my brother who checked all of my Hebrew um, with the readings that I had from the Hebrew text. And so then I finally published, and that was at the end of 2016. And my book now, The World's Oldest Alphabet, is the most controversial book in the field of ancient Near Eastern historical studies. Three highly reputed scholars, before it actually came out um, from the press for anyone to be able to have and to read through and to, you know, to, to figure out if I'm right or wrong, three highly reputed scholars denounced my thesis publicly. Isn't that amazing? I thought being a scholar means you do scholarship in the right way, that you're objective. And when somebody in your field comes out with a brand new discovery, what do you do? You put it on trial. You give it, you give it its fair day in court. And if it ends up being able to prove itself to be true, you agree with it and you change what your view was. If you find that it's not true, then you write 
publicly that it was wrong. But the very fact that three highly respected scholars denounced my thesis before the book ever came out should tell you an extremely large amount about what they concluded. They had an agenda. They had to prove it to be false. They had to let everyone out there know you can't trust this before it ever was in their hands to examine in a scholarly fashion. A movie was made about this, uh, Patterns of Evidence, the second installment in a series, and the subtitle of that film is The Moses Controversy. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to see it. Um, you can get the DVD on the, the uh, PatternsofEvidence.com uh, website uh, for a reasonable price. You know, that's through um, Tim Mahoney, the producer of the film. That, that all goes to them and, and the debt that they incurred um, to be able to um, make this film. And it was shown in, in over 850 theaters across the U.S. when it came out. And that's an expensive thing to do, to rent those theaters. So um, I'm thankful that it came out. And the centerpiece of the book was this very topic. When Tim Mahoney found out about the discoveries in my book, he contacted me right away. And he flew me to Minneapolis, and I spent four or five days in his studio being interviewed for the film. That's how serious he took it. So thankfully, there was somebody out there who took this discovery very seriously. And it demonstrates that just as the Bible said, we have an authentic Moses. Because one of the inscriptions, Sinai 361, actually mentions Moses himself. And if you think I came to that on a whim, you'd be absolutely wrong. Because there's other ways of translating the mem shin um, word in Hebrew. And I tried in that context every single other option before I even entertained the idea that this could be Moses. But it's Moshe. Moshe, the Hebrew word for Moses. So, um, one of those inscriptions, Sinai 115, I have it here in red, is the one that connected me in the beginning to all of this understanding that this was Hebrew. So, um, if you remember, we're down here in southwestern Sinai. On the map, it's a really tiny dot at the site of Serbit il Khadim. We looked at that last time, and I showed you that there was this... Um, um, it's, it's like a... I don't know, it's, it's like a mining town, if you will. It's a mining town that was built, and they had, um, they had um, temple buildings that were there, and they also had these eight to nine foot tall stone inscribed stele that would give an account of that year's expedition down to the mines. And I probably showed you this. Sinai 115, the important one, is actually in this view. It's that one to the right where I have the black arrow pointing down. And at the very base of that is what we're going to look at. Above, it's hieroglyphic text from top to bottom, rows um, right to left that describe that year's um, um, campaign down to the, to the turquoise mines. But at the base of it, there's an important drawing. This photo was taken in, I forget what it was, 20s or 30s by the Egypt Exploration Society, and they allowed me to have this image. And this shows you at the very bottom that donkey and Chebeded on top of the donkey. Remember, we saw this before with Sinai 112. That this is a different stella where we had the, the man seated on the donkey, Chebeded, he who was disfavored, and there was the Egyptian to the left who was his attendant, and then to the right there's this boy who every time... There's a new stella erected, and it's by Chebeded. The boy keeps getting taller and taller. Well, if you look at Sinai 115, now the boy's head, if you look at the far right, is now higher than the, um, the ears of the donkey. Whereas with Sinai 112, I don't know if you can see it here, but his, to the right, his head only goes to the, um, to the kind of the crown of the head of the um, donkey before his ears even start to go up. So clearly, Sinai 115 is one of the last inscriptions that Chebeded produced at the site. So I took this image and this image and 
one other image, three images, and I made a composite drawing. It took me so many hours, folks, you wouldn't believe it. Um, putting these images onto PowerPoint, blowing them up up to 400% viewing, sometimes less, sometimes all the way up to that point, and then drawing line by line carefully every bit of what, was, what's, what remains as visible that's part of this um, caption, this drawing and caption. And that's what it is. It's a drawing and caption above. So, um, what's on the text? Well, if you were to take this image, which I started with, this was the, the basis for the, the composite drawing, because the, m the most amount of material can be found on this image. In the upper left are, th are three pictographs. There's the feather hieroglyph that makes the... Um, uh, can ma make the sound of a consonant or a, an E vowel. And then um, in between that and the one that's to the far right, to the f uh, I'm sorry, to the far left in the left upper corner, that's a mouth um, in the upper left corner. That makes the, the R sound in Egyptian, the R sound. So the middle one between them, though, I knew right away that's not a hieroglyph. It's something different. And there's another, um, there's another hieroglyph, oh no, there's another pictograph on here that's actually um, the second from the right going right to left at the top. It looks like an hourglass, actually. So I couldn't make heads or tails of that hourglass or of this big box square thing. So I went to um, a man my dad's age, a Western Semiticist who's, you know, probably an octogenarian by now, and I said to him, um, can you tell me what this hourglass is and what this box thing is? And he said, oh, that's easy. The hourglass thing, that is an ingot. And it's from Canaanite. And, uh, and it makes a, um, it's called a syllabic. It makes the sound of a consonant and a vowel. So if, if you had a consonant and a vowel, that, that gives you a syllable. So we call that a syllabic. And it's the we sound. And he said, the box, that is a protoconsonantal letter. That's from the world's oldest alphabetic script. And I said, what? I said, what is a Canaanite syllabic and what is the world's oldest alphabetic script? That's how much I knew. So I quickly caught up on 150 years of scholarship. Quickly in quotes. And through that process, I studied this inscription. Only the, only the, and what you see from right to left at the top was translated by an Egyptologist in the 1950s. Gardiner, wonderful Egyptologist. He translated six Syrians. And when he says Syrians, he means a Levantine person. And the word here is Ichinwi. Ichinwi. That should be almost familiar to you if, if you remember from an earlier time together when I said the Egyptians called the people in the Levant Rechenu. Well, the people in the Levant called themselves each and we. They're related. The each and, each and we and the retinue, it's this one and the same. So this is a person who was native or connected to that area, not someone who's foreign or an Egyptian. So, and then there's six um, marks, one strokes, one, two, three, four, five, six. That means the number six. And the adjective always comes second, so it's six each and we. Six people from the Levant. And that's as much as Gardner translated, then he stopped translating. And it took me weeks to work with what was left that needed to be translated. So that's what I came up with, you know, the pictographs that are there, and I had to figure out what this, the rest of this means in the caption. Well, those, those top three on the left um, pictographs together mean ivre. Uh, ivre is, in plural, the Hebrew way to say of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to say Hebrews of. That's what it means. Hebrews of. Ivre. Then, the, um, the animal that looks like a goose, um, that's the geb glyph. And that's part of a word, um, so that's part of the word um, gebitu, 
and Gebitu means the earth god. And the way to connect that is, okay, so we have six Levantine people, Hebrews, and then that wavy line is of, that's a repetition of of, of, and then there's a site name. That's got to be a site name. So Gebitu has to be the site where that happened. And it means earth god. How does that work? Well, where did Jacob have an appearance? Um, where did he have an encounter with God? Bethel. Bethel. And what later was important about the city of Bethel in Jacob's life? After this. Was he always living in Bethel? No, he wasn't. God appeared to him and said, take up your family, get rid of your idols, and go to Bethel. And that's what he did. It became their new homestead. It became their hometown. Um, for me, home will always be Akron, Ohio. You know, you think of that maybe as LeBron James's city, but it's not. It's my city. I was, it was my city way before his. So that will always be home. That's what this is, folks. These are six Levantine people, Hebrews of Earth God. Earth God. What's Earth God? Well, it was at Bethel, first of all, where Jacob had that encounter with God, right? And so when Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, would have heard this story, they, of course, would have known all of the stories of Egyptian um, religion. And they would have known of the earth God. He's the one who meets people on the earth, right? And he, he controls things that happen on the earth. That's Geb, the earth God. And that being the case, when they heard the story about their grandfather, they would have connected that encounter with God that Jacob described or, or that Joseph described to them. They would have connected it to Geb, the earth God. That's the connection for them. It's the God who manifests himself on planet Earth and controls things on Earth. That's the one who would have wrestled with Jacob. So when Manasseh writes Geb Bitu, Bitu is the Akkadian word for, um, for um, house. So the Akkadian word house and the word earth god together House of the earth god, house of God. House of God is the meaning of Bethel. This is their hometown. Bethel is where they lived when Joseph was taken off into slavery. Bethel. So when Ephraim and Manasseh would have grown up under their father, he would have told them stories of precious Bethel, the home city of his before he was taken away into slavery. And it would have been ingrained in their minds Bethel, and they would have had a, they would have had a, a devotion, a loyalty to that city, even though they never lived there themselves. So when they write here, it's from their hearts that they write. We are six Levantine people on this expedition, Hebrews of Bethel, and then the last word there, underneath that, you see the bread loaf. Underneath that bread loaf is another hieroglyph. That's what we call the merglyph. It means beloved. Hebrews of Bethel, the beloved. It's their cherished city, like Akron, Ohio for me. It's my cherished city that I'll always have as my hometown. Same for them. Hebrews of Bethel, the beloved. And this is how, this is a really busy image, but how I fill in all of the things that are important. So that's the translation of the inscription. Um, and let me move forward just to this to close up. So, Sinai 115 now has a reference to Hebrews in it. What's the significance of that, among other things? It's now the oldest inscription we have attesting to the Israelites. By far the oldest inscription. Until now, well, first, as of the 1800s, we had this Mernap Tostela that mentions Israel and... That was the oldest one. Then in 2010, um, a colleague of mine, Peter Vanderveen, and several others came out with an article based on what's called a Berlin, the Berlin pedestal where they found this, um, in this conquest list, there was the name Israelites in it, and it dates, according to their 
to their, um, their epigrapher, the person who handles ancient inscriptions, and I'm an epigrapher, he compared this to other inscriptions of the day and said, this is about from the time of Amenhotep II. Amenhotep II is the Exodus pharaoh. This is a mention of the Israelites captured after, immediately after the Exodus. Because the same year of the Exodus, under his rule, Amenhotep II, that was in April. In November, he launched a military campaign into Canaan where he acquired 100,000 slaves. Nothing like this was ever, take, was ever done in Egyptian history. And that was commemorated in a stella called the Memphis Stella. And in the, in the Memphis Stella, among the 100,000 slaves that were captured, 3,600 of them were Apiru, which is the Egyptian way to say Habiru. And Habiru is the Akkadian way to say Hebrew. 3,600 Hebrews were captured, according to the Memphis Stella, months after the Exodus. Why would, why would 100,000 slaves be taken from Canaan? Because they just lost, Egypt just lost their entire slave base. That was the machinery that made everything work in Egypt. So he replaced them. This is a second reference to captured Israelites from the time of the Exodus Pharaoh, months after the event took place. This, as of 210, nine years ago, became the oldest reference to the Israelites. But now, and you can read about it yourself, now we go back from 1219 to 1446 all the way back to 1842 B.C. The first and earliest reference to Israelites in the name Hebrews. And again, God did all of this to make his name great on the earth in our day. For us to behold, for us to be in greater awe of him, and for him to accomplish purposes through this that go way beyond what any of us could imagine. Um, and I'll close with a quick story. After my book was published, a guy who lived in Dallas, young guy, maybe 20s, he's a Christian who teaches... Um, chemistry, I think it is, in the Dallas area. Um, he had recently become a Christian, and people were challenging him about the validity of all of that. So he decided, I'm going to study one of the biblical languages to see if Christ this Christianity thing is true. He had committed, but he wasn't, you know, 100% sold out, right? So he studies Hebrew so that he could figure it out for himself. And after a year of studying Hebrew, guess what happens? My book just got published after he studied the language, completed the study. He found out about the book, he got a copy, and he read it. It so blew him away that that is what God used to solidify in his mind and in his heart that the Hebrew language can be connected to the people that we read about in the Bible who were around back in these days. And he drove all the way down from Dallas just to have lunch with me to tell me the impact of that book on his life. Isn't that amazing? That's how important this is. That proved to me this is serious business. And this is why I am under attack from the enemy, left and right in ways I can't even describe to you, that bring tears to my eyes, that break my heart, because the enemy is after me for doing this and for what's going to be published in the second book if I can get it finished, Lord willing, that connects all of this together. That's how important this is, folks. Lives are impacted by this and God's glory is revealed in it because He's chosen our day to make this known again after thousands of years. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege that we've had of taking a sweep through ancient history. On one hand, it's a very unknowable place and time and, and era, but because there's so much out there for us now that we can study, we can know many things. And as you dropped these discoveries into my lap, one after another, 
during those years from 2012 until whenever it ended, 2014 or 15, um, you increased my awe of you, my fear of you, my desire to see your name honored, my desire to see your truth come out, to see many people be exposed to the, the confirmation of the history in the Bible. Because I know that in universities across the world, as you do, Lord, way better than I do, that there are professors persuading or attempting to, to persuade Christian kids to turn away from the Christian faith because you can't trust the history in the book, so you can't trust the message, the spiritual message. But the more I study, the more I learn, the more I can refute those arguments, the, the more powerful the history of the Bible appears. And that's what you've called me to do, to show men and women and young people how important this is and how much it verifies that you and your word can be trusted. So challenge our hearts challenge our minds, use us as ambassadors to communicate this truth to others and do it to the glory of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.